So hi everyone and welcome to this video on the Stackelberg uh, oligopoly model uh, which is essentially the quantity leadership model and it's the third type of model that we will discuss. So uh, in the past few videos we've discussed the Cournot model which uh, sets uh, quantity. Then we also dis discussed the Bertrand model which sets based on price. Now, uh, we're going to discuss the Stackelberg model, right, which is uh, another form of model developed by a German economist. His name was uh, Heinrich von Stackelberg in 1934 as a sort of another criticism to the Kernow model. And essentially, this particular model is an extension of the Kernow model. So it just extends a very simple Kernow model. But it allows for some key differences. The main difference of which is that it allows for asymmetric behavior by two firms or uh, in, a in a duopolistic market, but actually it allows it for n number of firms. So th that assumption of asymmetric uh, behavior and the presence of asymmetric information plays a crucial role in terms of understanding this particular model. And in this model, we assume that, uh, suppose we're operating in a duopoly case, in that one firm okay, will play an aggressive role in the market. So there's this one firm with a great deal of uh, power, right? Because this is an oligopoly, firms have power. And that firm is relatively more aggressive in its actions. And it might be referred to as the market leader, right? Which is a concept that you may be familiar with. And the other firm, right, in the market will play a more passive role and it will be the follower. So both firms have market power, of course, but then generally in the market, the leader would opt to set the tone. And in setting the tone, it has an information advantage and it can uh, sort of take advantage of the, uh, of the asymmetries present and opt to gain a higher profit even though both firms in the market will extensively gain a high profit as well. So um, the leader firm, so that uh, the firm that which we deem the leader, will choose its output level first, right? And it will set a profit maximizing quantity, taking into consideration the quantity it expects the follower to set in reaction to its own choice. So the leader firm is aware that it is the leader firm. And what it will do is it will set whatever quantity it chooses to produce at a profit maximizing level, but it also takes into account potentially what uh, the follower firm would uh, sort of uh, take as its quantity given its uh, choice. So the leader has this information that it can utilize to be able to uh, maximize profit in a nicer way or in a better way than a follower firm, definitely. And uh, what happens is, right, the leader will also assume that the follower will also want to maximize its profits, but the follower no, but the leader knows that the follower will accept the leader's output choice as a given, right? So the follower takes uh, the leader's uh, choice the leader's choice as given. So that's something that it cannot have influence on, similar to uh, the case of a Carnot uh, model. But in this case, right, we know that the decision of the leader has some role to play in the follower's uh, decision. So uh, that's different from a regular Carnot assumption in which both firms set their uh, quantity simultaneously, right? And... Uh, this assumption, right, permits the leader to essentially predict the follower's output choice and take that choice into account when it makes its own output choice, right? Uh, and this differs from your standard Cournot model in that the two firms act symmetrically in that they set their output levels simultaneously or in a case that both just behave as follower firms. In this case, there's one leader and one follower and there's information asymmetry. So one firm can potentially act ahead of another firm and the other firm has to take whatever the leader firm's um, output as, as a given, right? So uh, to illustrate this, say we have one duopolist, which uh, is a leader duopolist. So this is your leader firm. 
And this leader firm is sufficiently sophisticated enough to recognize that its competitor acts on the Carnot assumption. So uh, the rival firms or the competitor, the competitor firm, since this is just a duopolis, will set its output based on the Carnot assumptions. And this allows the leader to determine the output reaction function of its rival, right? Essentially to determine the ORF of its rival. And what it will do is it will incorporate that ORF into its own profit function, which it then proceeds to maximize like a typical monopolist, right? So it will try to take that output as given, try to predict that knowing that that follower firm will take its output as given. And uh, the leader will then assume that the rival firm will choose output on the basis of the reaction function, right? So uh, that the leader firm has a lot of control in this case in that it can sort of predict what the follower firm will end up doing. And in doing that prediction, it can uh, set a potentially a sort of condition that uh, can maximize its own profit, right? Uh, as with any case. So how does an equilibrium case operate in this particular model? So we discussed a Carnot equilibrium and as a Bertrand equilibrium. We said that the Carnot equilibrium some, lies somewhere between a monopoly and a perfectly competitive market, while a Bertrand model with homogeneous products, right, acts very, very similarly to that of a perfectly competitive market. How does the Stackelberg equilibrium look like? Well, Let's assume that there are only two firms in the market and we let the market demand be this uh, uh, direct, uh, I'm sorry, inverse market demand function, wherein, of course, the demand is downward sloping, of course, and that the entire market demand is supplied by firm one and firm two's output, wherein firm uh, one, okay, uh, firm one is our quantity leader and firm two is the follower. Then we also let the firm have each their own cost functions and the cost uh, is greater than or equal to zero. The marginal cost is greater than or equal to zero. So firm one, again, is the quantity leader and firm two is the follower. And the follower firm, which is firm two, chooses its output based on the Carnot assumption, right? But firm one behaves a bit differently. So in this case, the Stackelberg leader, which is firm one, right, this firm, is assumed to know and estimate the follower firm's ORF. So the follower firm's quantity, that's Q2, is some function of the level that it expects uh, the firm one to set, right, uh, similar to a Carnot. And this is obtained using a Carnot, right? Mm -hmm. And given that firm one knows the output that will be produced by firm two, it can estimate its relevant residual demand curve, uh, which is the proportion of the market demand curve after firm two's chosen output. What will be left of the market demand after firm two had supposedly chosen. And uh, this looks something like this, right? So in the case, in this case, the residual demand function for firm one is if you look at the entire market demand, so this is P as some function of Q. So we know that Q, big Q, is just equal to Q1 plus Q2, which is the output produced by firm 1 or the output produced by firm 2. And we know that Q2, right, is some function of Q1, right? Because the, the follower firm takes uh, the leader's quantity as a given, right? Because it is the follower firm. So it must take the leader's actions uh, into consideration since they, won't, they, since they don't set things simultaneously. And uh, what happens is well, you notice that the entire demand function okay, is just some function of Q1, right? So this expression can be thought of as the residual demand curve faced by the Stackelberg leader in that it tells the leader how much the market price will vary as a function of its own quantity choice, taking into account the follower's reaction to that quantity choice, right? So it will take that into account. Then what we can do from that notion is we can formulate, right, 
this Tackleberg leader's problem. And essentially, the goal of the leader is, of course, to maximize profit. So profit one. So say firm one's the leader, right? And it's going to maximize profit as some function of Q1. And we know that profit is just revenue one minus cost one, since this is firm one. And revenue one, right, this one, is just your demand function, P times Q, uh, P as a function of Q1, times the total output of firm one, that's Q1, minus uh, C1, Q1, right? And this is essentially, right, the Stackelberg leader's problem. And the FOC, okay, for that is just about deriving profit, okay, with respect to Q1. Note, this is not a partial derivative because everything's just a function of Q1. And this is equal to zero, right, to get the extremum. Then the SOC just has to prove that it's a maximum so that the second order partial derivative of profit with respect to Q1 should be definitely negative. And it can be shown that the first order condition for firm one, so this condition here, requires that MR1 right, is equal to MC1. Okay, so that's the first order condition. And um, you can use this condition to solve for Q1 star, which is the optimal output of the quantity leader. Then what you'll know, do is the follower firm, which is firm two, will then produce an output based on its reaction function given the output produced by the Stackelberg leader, which is Q1. So we have to plug this into Q2's case because, again, it takes Q1 star as given, which is the action of the leader firm. Therefore, the equilibrium market price is obtained by substituting the two firms' outputs in the inverse market demand function. And uh, th that's essentially the case of a Stackelberg uh, oligopoly. So uh, I, I hope you notice the difference between a Carnot oligopoly and a Stackelberg oligopoly being primarily the presence of information asymmetry, which allows for the presence of leader firms and follower firms. And uh, in the next video, we're going to use actually the same example that we've been using, but this time um, consider... Uh, two firms, which act, one of which acts like a leader and one acts like a follower, as in our Stackelberg case. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video.